Good morning, good morning. Wonderful. Goes into how great thou art and how wonderful it is. We can praise him today. for just briefly uh, through windshields or through uh, car windows or something like that. We got to see you a little bit. It did my heart good. Uh, I hope it did your heart good as well. And uh, anyway, uh, I want to just say a few things here um, to uh, try to encourage one another, if you possibly can, uh, on the phone or through emails uh, or, or some line of communication there. Uh, let's lift one another up in prayer and encourage one another. And, um, and I really don't have any brand new prayer requests, so I'm just going to tell you, let's pray one for another, and uh, let's pray for our health care workers uh, who are on the front line with this virus, and then also pray for our leaders, uh, our local leaders, and then all the way up to the federal level. Let's pray for all those as they have many decisions to make, and they're under a lot of pressure uh, right now uh, to make decisions, and so we need to pray for them. And, uh, and hopefully uh, be praying that the Lord allow us to meet together again real soon. And, uh, and so, but let's start with a word of prayer today, and, and then we'll sing some more. All right, Father, we are again so grateful uh, to have the technology that we have, that you've allowed us to have, to be able uh, to communicate uh, via internet or, or YouTube or whatever 
uh, fashion that, that preachers and people are able to use. And Lord, we're thankful for uh, the ones who are here this morning. We have a special singer here, and, and uh, he's going to do a great job here in just a moment. And Lord, uh, we have Miss um, Cynthia and Kevin. And Lord, we appreciate the work that they do uh, in helping uh, to create these services and the singing and the, and the running the sound and all that. And my wife is here running the camera. We want to just thank you for all those who are helping and serve. Uh, during this time, we pray that you would uh, help us to do the best of our ability. And, uh, and Lord, we pray for the message here just a little bit. You speak to our hearts. And uh, Lord, we pray you'd be honored, uplifted, and glorified in, in all that we do. And, uh, and again, I want to pray for each and every uh, person who's going to be listening to this, that you would uh, uh, place a hedge of protection about them uh, during these uncertain times. And Lord, we just pray that they'd be encouraged and uplifted today in all that's said and done. And uh, may you, above all, be glorified in what we say and what we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry we don't have the words for you. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty with that. But you know what? It doesn't matter. God's always...
join us this morning. So we're kind of doing a little sequence here, and uh, but we're and there's three passages that we're going to look at today dealing with that with that topic, and uh, and so I want to begin, and it, it very interesting is we're going we're going to end up reading all three of these, but in the book of Luke uh, it says that he was carried into heaven, 
In Acts, it says that he was taken into heaven. And in, and in Mark, he says he was received into heaven. I, those are three different verbs or three different actions that are taken uh, as the Lord is ascending back into heaven. Now, we've already talked about, again, the death, burial, and resurrection. That is the gospel. And, uh, and now he spent 40 days and, uh, on the earth, and then he ascended back into heaven. And we're starting in Luke chapter 24 and verse number 50. Uh, verse number 50, it says, And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Now, this first particular instance we're looking at in the book of Luke, it's interesting that he, he, he's saying that he brought them to Bethany. Now, Bethany, if you study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find there are many places initially when he was doing miracles he was accepted. But when it came out that he was proclaiming himself to be deity and the Son of God, and that he uh, was the Messiah, when, when he was proclaiming that type of stuff, people began to back off and, and he was began to be rejected. And, uh, and many times they even tried to entrap him. They tried to, again, push him off a cliff one time. They tried to kill him uh, even before the cross. And, uh, and so, but here he is at Bethany. Now, Bethany is a place, if you will remember in, in your Bible study, if you remember this, this is a place where Matt, uh, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, this is where their home was. And so if you, if you think of that, uh, think of Bethany. This is a place where Mary came in and washed Jesus' feet with her hair and broke the alabaster box. Remember that? There was worship that was going on in Bethany. All right? And then, uh, again, Jesus would come into their house and eat, and he was welcome in Bethany. And uh, can you imagine the fellowship that they had there? And uh, so he, there was fellowship, and he was welcomed, and he was worshipped at Bethany. And this is the place just before he gets to Bethany where he was ascended back into heaven and received up into heaven into glory. Now, I want you to think about this. There's a lot of places that Jesus is rejected. There's a lot of places that he is not worshipped. There's a lot, of a lot of places that he is not welcomed. But he left a place here on earth where he was welcomed and he was worshipped. And I want you to think the moment that he got to glory, he was welcomed. Look what it says there. It says he was carried. That's interesting. It, it didn't say that he walked or he, it says that he was carried. Now, who was doing the carrying? It doesn't say. But I just think that's an interesting thing. But he was welcomed there in another place we're going to look at. It says that he was received. He was received into heaven. That's in Mark, in the Mark account of this. We'll look at that in just a minute. But he was received. Now, I want you to think about Bethany, the, the, the relationships that he had, the worship that he had, uh, the welcome that he had. And then I want you to notice now where he leaves from Bethany and goes to heaven. What do you think about the welcome and the worship and the fellowship that he had at that moment when he entered into glory? Again, uh, it, it, physically present there with the Heavenly Father. And uh, he returned not in defeat. He, didn't re he, he, he came and he accomplished everything that he set out to do. So when he returned in, back into heaven, he did not go in defeat. He, he went in victory uh, um, with, with, just think of this. As he entered back into heaven, he was carrying the keys of death, hell, and the grave because he was victorious over all of it. And, and I can imagine, you know, all the times when God the Father would say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He was received into heaven. He was carried into heaven. And uh, he was taken into heaven where he was welcomed and he was worshipped as he should be. Now, uh, again, in Philippians chapter 2, you remember the verses. It says that he took upon him the form of a serpent, being found in fashion, man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then the Bible says that God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Why was he exalted? It's because he perfectly fulfilled the plan of God for his life. He was perfect in perfect obedience. He was the holy sacrifice. He did everything uh, according to God's plan. God was well pleased. And so when he returned back into heaven, can you imagine that, that reunion there? That reunion with all the saints that had gone before, the Old Testament saints, 
uh, and, and, and again reunited with the Father in heaven physically. Can, in, in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, you remember uh, Isaiah uh, saw the Lord high and lifted up. And what were they doing? What, 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 what is the picture that Isaiah saw? They were all, even the angels were worshiping. The angels were there. Can you imagine? As Jesus was ushered back into heaven, the angels that were around, knowing that, that all that he had accomplished for mankind, that redemption had been paid, that the price of sin had been, had been paid, and, and deliverance had been offered to every man. Think of that. And so now they're worshiping. They're worshiping the Savior. In, in, in the vision of Isaiah, it says that, that they covered their feet, they covered their eyes, and they, and they flew. They had three sets of wings, right? And with one they were flying, with one they were covering their feet, and with one they were covering their face. Because of the glory and because of the exaltation of God Himself. And, and this is the same, the same God that Jesus is. This is, who, this is who He is. He's God. And He is being worshipped in this very moment. And, and we understand from this account that this is something that has already happened. All right, this is something that has already happened. It has already occurred. Now, because of this, I want us to also look at something that is occurring. The, the ascension. The ascension has already occurred, but because of the ascension, there is something that is occurring or is happening at this very moment. Let's go look in Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16, verse number 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and look what it says, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. It says here, he says he was received up into heaven, and it says, and he sat on the right hand of God. This is very important. The, he was sitting at the right hand of God. This is a place of privilege. This is a place of power. And by the way, this is a place, a place where the priest sits. I want you to think of this. Let's go to Romans. And, and just, just for clarification here. In Romans chapter 8, verse number 34. The Bible says this. It says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. All right, so there's something that has already happened. That is the ascension. That's something that has already occurred. But there's something that is occurring at this very moment. And what is that that is happening at this very moment? In, Mark, in, in the book of Mark, it says that he ascended and he's at the right hand of God. And then we read in Romans that he's at the right hand of God, but there's something that he's doing while he's at the right hand of God. What is he doing? He is interceding. He is interceding. This is the, this is the job of the high priest. The high priest, what, what the high priest would do, remember in the Old Testament, the high priest would take the sacrifice once a year and he would, he would offer that sacrifice. He would go in and through the holy place and into the holy of holies. And when he entered into the holy of holies, there were certain criteria that had to be met. He had to be pure. He had to be holy. He had to be right, as right with God as he could possibly be. There were certain things he had to accomplish. And he would take the blood of that sacrifice and he would go and sprinkle that blood sacrifice on the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where God met man. Remember, this is where God met man. And so he would go in between, if you would. He would intercede on behalf of everybody else that could not enter into the holy place. And so he would enter into the holy place on behalf of, of, of the people. And he would go in and, and speak with God on behalf of the people and offer that atonement or that blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. So now, let's think about Jesus Christ for a moment. Now, Jesus Christ, when he bled and died on the cross of Calvary, the, the, the Bible is, go read Matthew 27, when, the, when, the, uh, when Jesus Christ died, there were certain things that happened inside the temple. Remember, uh, the Bible says that the, the temple veil was ripped. It was torn from top to bottom. What does that signify? That signifies that we now can enter into the holy place. We now can enter into the presence of God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, because he's gone on our behalf already. And he's done that and he's opened the way and now we can boldly enter into the throne of grace that we can find mercy and, and help in time of need. And so, 
So this is what Jesus is doing at this very moment. He's a high priest who intercedes for us. The veil has been torn. Uh, let me go to read a, 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 a scripture in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15. For we have not an high priest which not, cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what, what is he saying here? It, it, we have a high priest who has already gone through everything that we will ever go through. Look what it says here. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. There's two negatives in there. Let me read it in a positive way. All right, we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Uh, so we'll say it that way. It means the same thing. So we have a high priest, which is Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father in this very moment. And he's sitting in a position of power. He's sitting in a, in a, in a place of privilege. But he's sitting there also as our priest. He's interceding for us. He's interceding for us. Now, I want you to think about Jesus Christ for a moment as our high priest. He is one who has gone before us. Now, remember when he died on the cross, he not only carried our sin. Did he carry our sin? Yes, he carried our sin. But is that the only thing that he carried? That is not the only thing that he carried. He carried, like you already saying, he carried our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He carried all, everything that we would ever have to go through. He carried our depressions. He carried our worries. He carried our fears. He carried all those things. And so when we can go and pray to God the Father, there is somebody who advocates for us on our behalf to God the Father who says, you know what? I've already carried that for Him. We need to answer that prayer. I've already taken that I've already taken that, that, that sorrow. I've already taken that fear. I've already taken that punishment. I've already taken that price, the price of sin. I've already taken the wrath of God for this person. And He stands on our behalf and He intercedes to God the Father on our behalf. He's already called, in the Old Testament, he's called the man of sorrows. And he did. He carried our griefs. He carried our sorrows. And everything that we'll ever go through, he already knows about and he's already experienced. And he's touched. He's concerned. He knows about everything that we go to. And I'm telling you, he's waiting on us to, to give all of our sorrows and all of our worries and all of our burdens and all of our fears to him because he's the one who can he's already carried it and he can go to God on our behalf and intercede on our behalf so that we can find help in time of need that's what it says so we can find help in time of need <clears throat> all right so these are things we've looked at something that's already happened now we're looking at something that's happened at this very moment. Think of that. This very moment, Jesus Christ intercedes for us at this very moment. Now, let's go to Luke in uh, Acts chapter 1. This is another account of the ascension. And we're going to look at something that is going to occur or will occur. Acts chapter number 1. Let's look at verse number 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, I want you like that, this same Jesus, the same one who touched the blinded eyes, the same one who walked the streets of Galilee, who, who walked the, on the seashore of Galilee, who walked the streets of, of Jerusalem, the same one who bled and died on the cross for us, the same one who rose again, that same Jesus, the one who ascended back into heaven, that same Jesus. Look what it says. That same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So there's something that has already happened, right? That's his ascension. There's something that's going on at this very moment, and that is his intercession. And then there's something that is, that, is, that is going to happen, and that is going to be his return. This is something that's going to occur. By the way, there are so many people that, that laugh at this. You know, it has been over 2,000 years since his promise has been made, right? That the Lord is going to return. He, he said it many times. You know, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I am, there you may be also. I'm coming again. He, uh, he's going to receive us unto himself. Said, again, in Thessalonians, 
Uh, we read it in Revelation. We read it. We read all about this. And there are mockers in, in 2 Peter. Uh, I'm going to read a verse there. It's, it says, uh, you don't have to turn there. Um, but in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 3, the Bible says this. It says, knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own, uh, own lust. Now, what is a scoffer? It's somebody who makes fun, who laughs at it. And there's a lot of people who will laugh at people like you and I, people who will laugh at Christians because we're still looking for uh, the coming Savior. We're still looking for Him. Just like He promised, just like He promised uh, that He was going to do. And there are people that scoff and people that laugh. As a matter of fact, uh, people that scoff him not just at His coming, but at God Himself. Uh, that Governor Cuomo, uh, you know, the one in New York, mm. and uh, he, he made a statement recently as coronavirus cases were decreasing. And this is the statement that he made. He said, God didn't do this. He said, we did this because of our hard work. And I'm going to tell you something. There's one thing that I will say about that is that he is mistaken. But the other thing that I will say about that is that he, without even knowing it, he is acknowledging God. He is acknowledging God in his mind and in his conscience and, and through his statements. He's acknowledging God. And I'm going to tell you, he may laugh and he may scoff now, but there's going to come a time where he will not. Amen. He will not laugh and he will not scoff. And, you know, and we think about us looking for the Savior. I tell you, we ought to wake up every single day wondering if this is going to be the day the Savior comes. You know, the disciples, they actually thought that he was going to come at any moment. You know, this, this is what they believed, and this ought to be the same belief that we have. We ought to wake up every morning thinking that this may be the day that Jesus comes. You know, when we lay down at night, we ought to be thinking, hey, this may be the night when Jesus comes like a thief in the night. It may be that day. It may be. And so when we lay down to sleep, we, 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 may, we ought to look at that uh, as uh, um, something that is going to happen as a certainty or something that is going to occur. Now, let's go over to Hebrews just a moment. We're going to look at a couple places in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. This is the faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11. And let's think about Abraham. Now Abraham lived well before the Messiah ever came. He well before, lived well before Jesus came to this earth. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 8. By faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and heirs of him of the same promise. Now look, what was he looking for? He, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What was he looking for? Was he looking for something that this world had to offer? Was he looking for something that he could go find over the next hill? This is not what he was looking for. He was looking for something that God had promised. He was looking for something that God said was he, that he was going to deliver. And I say to you that you and I are looking for the same thing if we're looking for the coming of Christ. Now look, look in chapter number 11, verse number 13. This is referring to other believers. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. So what were they looking for? They were looking for something. They were looking for a promise that they did not receive. They were looking for a country that had not been provided yet. They were looking for something that God had promised. And I say to you, when it... We're talking about the coming of the Lord. This is a promise that we should be looking for every moment of the day. Every moment of the day we should be looking for it. We should be expecting Him. So we looked at something that has already occurred, something that is occurring, something that's going to occur, and now we're going to look at something that should occur as a result of all of this. All right, As a result of, of what we learned already about the, the things encompassing, encompassing the ascension here, the things that have been mentioned is uh, let's go back and look at Luke again.
Luke 24. Let's uh, read again in verse 15. He led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Now look, what, what happened after that? What happened as a result of all that they had seen and all that they had heard at that moment? What, what did they do? Verse 52. And they worshipped him. They worshipped him. And returned to Jerusalem with what? Great joy. And were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So when we're thinking about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, what should that do for us? We, we see what has already happened, what is happening at this very moment, and what is going to happen. What should that cause us to do? That should cause us, first of all, to worship Him. That should cause us to worship Him. Knowing that, hey, He's still King of Kings. He's still Lord of Lords. He's the exalted one that's in heaven who's being worshipped at this very moment, who is interceding for us, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, who's doing all these things for us. He's paid the price for us. And uh, He's coming again. We understand that He should be worshipped. Now look, it says here, it says, with great joy. You know what? We live in a time of uncertainty, don't we? And I tell you, I have seen... Sometimes even in going in a store or, or waiting in a line or whatever else you see, you're seeing now what used to be sometimes in the South at least, very friendly, very open, and you're seeing some of the, you know, some of the, hey, stay away from me. You know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and you're seeing that. But anyway, and so that is in people's minds. And I'm going to tell you, I think sometimes the situations that we're in, we allow those situations to rob us of the joy that God wants to give us. And could it be that we're not, the joy that we should have that God wants to give us because our mind is not stayed on what God has done for us. Again, talking about the ascension, that He is ascending back into heaven, He's interceding for us, and He's coming again. This should bring us joy in our heart and our life. Doesn't matter what we have to go through. Doesn't matter what we're have to, having to endure. We're having to go through this virus. We're having to go through you know, uncertainty. We're having to go through leaders making crazy decisions at times. We're having to go through all this. But you know what? It should not rob us of our joy because we have something down deep that we have a promise of God knowing that He's going to fulfill everything that He's ever said, that He's interceding for us at this moment. He's coming again for us. Amen. The other thing is praising Him. We should be praising Him. We're worshiping Him. We have great joy and praising Him. Now I want us to go over to Mark. One other, one, other, one other thing that we ought to be doing in Mark chapter 16. Verse number 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth. And what did they do? And they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. They preached everywhere. You want me to tell you what we should be doing as Christians? Our worship should be as it should be. Our walk should be as it should be. But our witness, in, in, in accordance with, with these scriptures, in, in light of the ascension of Jesus Christ and all that that means, it ought to affect our witness. We ought to be going everywhere telling Jesus that, hey, telling people that Jesus is going to return. Telling people that Jesus is interceding for them. You know, there's nothing that does my heart sometimes even better to know that Jesus is sitting by the right hand of God on my behalf, interceding for me, knowing everything that I have gone through. And I want you to know, if you're his child, he's doing the exact same thing for you. Amen. And so people need to know that. People need to know that there's a Savior that bled and died for them and paid their sin debt, paid their, for their griefs, paid for their sorrows, and we need to get that message out there. There is never, look, in the, in the generation that I have lived in, there has never, ever been a greater opportunity to share Jesus Christ than the day that we're living at this very moment. People are living in uncertainty, and I'm going to tell you, we can have certainty in uncertainty. We, we can have God's promises. We can have God's peace in the middle of all the uncertainty, in the middle of all the, all the things going on around. We can have that and we can be at perfect peace because we know the one who's in control and we know the one who's seated at the right hand of God making intercession. We know the one who's coming back. We know all those things. And I'm going to tell you, we ought to be proclaiming this message because people need the peace of God. They need the, they need the purchase of God. They need, they need to know that Jesus is coming back and they need to be ready for it. 
They need to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And by the way, this ought to give us boldness in our witness. It ought to give us, you know, I, I tell you, over the years we have somehow, I, somehow, I don't know why, we have lost some of our boldness when, in speaking about Jesus Christ to the crowd or to, in public or to individuals outside. I'm going to tell you, we need to get rid of that. And I'm going to tell you, the closer we get to God, the bolder we're going to get. The Bible tells us that, that uh, in Acts, I believe it's chapter 4, if I remember right, and, and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were around the, the disciples. This is after. This is after the ascension. This is after uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had died. He was buried. He was rose again. He had sent back into heaven. The Holy Spirit had come. And, and then they were preaching. And, and, they, and it says here, it says that, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they took knowledge of them for what reason they had been with Jesus. Oh, my. And I think part of the joy that we're missing is because we're lost back of all the promises that God has given. And the reason we're not proclaiming like we ought to is because we're not spending the time with Jesus as we should. Because if we'd spend the time with Jesus and we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, we'd be filled with boldness to proclaim His message. So we looked at what did occur, what is occurring, what will occur, and then what should be occurring. Right? What should be occurring. We should be worshiping, we should be praising, we should be preaching. And, uh, and so, I want to ask you, what is your reaction to the ascension of Jesus Christ? What is your reaction? You know, it's not something, I, I don't know that I've preached on it very many times. I, I, I really don't, I don't, but it's a wonderful, wonderful passage, wonderful thoughts about what the Lord has done, what He is doing, what He's going to do, and what we should be doing. And a uh, wonderful thought. So, are you ready for His coming? Are you ready? If you don't know that you're ready for His coming, I will tell you, you need to make sure that you're as right with God as you can possibly be. But you also, to the, to the one who does not know Christ, you need, to, you need to repent of your sins and turn to Christ as His payment on the cross for your sin. He made that payment. And by faith, you can trust Him as your Savior and give all your sin to Him as your, and He will take it uh, as the payment and, uh, because He's already paid for it. And He will deliver you from, from the bondage of sin. And he will, he will give you a home in heaven. And, uh, and, and so to know him, to know him, uh, it makes all the difference in the world knowing Jesus Christ. So do you know him? Are you right with him? Does the ascension, has it affected your walk? Does it affect your worship? And does it affect your witness? It should affect all of these. And I pray to the Lord that it has. And I pray to the Lord that it does. Amen? All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we are again grateful for your word, the power of your word. And Lord, we're, uh, we hope and pray that something that was said today would be encouraging, uplifting, or convicting even uh, to the ones who are listening. Lord, we pray that you would uh, do what only you can do and uh, have your way in our hearts and our lives. Lord, I pray that we would be receptive and I pray that we'd be pliable to receive what you have for us. Lord, thank you again for loving us, being so good to us. Thank you that you are that priest that is our intercessor. Thank you again for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What better song to end this is the blessed assurance.